Good morning. So welcome to the latest episode of Fintech Worse. Today we'll be discussing account aggregator, which is in short referred to as AA. It is set to hold the promise of revolutionizing and even democratizing credit. Some even call it the UPI of lending. So what we'll do today is uh, we will discuss or marshal facts about the account aggregator and analyze it from all angles so that we can paint a comprehensive picture for our viewers. And to do that, we have a very distinguished panel joining us. We have with us BG Mahesh, who is the co-founder and CEO of Samiti. Samiti is an industry alliance who is strengthening and uh, promoting the adoption of account aggregator framework. And we have also with us Debshish Nagpal, who is a vice president, digital banking at HDFC. And finally, we have with us um, Raja Desh Pandey, who is the CEO and co-founder of Finbox. So we are uh, building credit infrastructure complete with uh, risk intelligence uh, so that platforms and lenders can offer digital credit. And finally, me, I'm Anna Catherine, and part of the marketing team at Finbox, and I'll be moderating this session. So without further ado, let's just jump straight in. Uh, I'd like to first start with Devshish. So if you could just set the context and tell us what exactly is account aggregator and more importantly, why did RBI feel the need to introduce a framework such as this? What was the original problem? Uh, thank you so much. Um, the account aggregator is, is, a, is a framework wherein uh, data sharing systems uh, required uh, from the consumer as per, as as an F, from the consumer for FIU and FIP purposes are shared. Account aggregator is is actually makes a consumer a real a real king in terms of uh, sharing what he or she wants to share. Uh, this has come up. Account aggregator framework came in the month of September 2021. RBI introduced it uh, to the banking industry banking ecosystem. It actually replaces the long. You know, earlier we used to carry checkbook, we used to do notarizations for availing credits, for availing any additional functionalities of the product for the bank. This actually, account aggregator is actually a blessing. As you rightly said, it's kind of a UPI. It gives the consumer a right to uh, what he wants to share, how much he wants to share. Uh, it's a con completely a consent-based data sharing platform between a consumer and uh, the regulated entities uh, for availing a banking services. So uh, in a way, I can say it's a blessing in disguise for the consumers. It is a blessing in disguise for the regulated entities, reduces the hassle of paperwork, makes the complete transaction digital. And the best part is the data is completely encrypted. It's not that you know uh, an account aggregator can aggregate your data and Kind of there's a chances of leakages no it's completely secured they they may be called an account aggregator but they don't aggregate your data so that's the beauty of uh, the system and from the consumer perspective it's completely safe uh, it helps the consumer as well as the banking ecosystem to make a decision fast uh, without earlier we all know it should, it should take three to four days for availing any services which can be done in clicks of uh, of your mouse and the data is pushed to uh, the regulated entities and they can make their decision basis the data that they receive from the other regulated entities yes that's that's about it thank you Devshish. i'd like to go next to rajat rajat in terms of lending uh, how exactly does a work and let's say now how Devshish was telling it puts the customer in charge what does it look like in real life digital lending Absolutely. Um, thank you so much. And uh, it's wonderful to uh, be part of this panel today. And I was just, uh, you know, just before we uh, start this conversation, we uh, I was just talking to Mahesh and, you know, there has been uh, this big breakthrough uh, with the account aggregator framework where SBI has come on to the framework and, you know, it's in testing at least for us. Uh, and that this is a massive milestone for the entire uh, country and you know what it means for financial inclusion. And uh, over uh, overall, I'll just uh, so Devashish beautifully summarized what it meant means for the consumer. 
I'll quickly uh, take the perspective of what it means for uh, the lending systems and workflows that sort of go into, um, you know, uh, go into sort of uh, driving financial inclusion in one way or driving sort of effective lending uh, that is digital uh, from a lender's perspective. Um, so, uh, you know, a lending transaction is essentially uh, two, three parts. One is establishing of identity, then it's establishing of credit worthiness, which is essentially, uh, you know, processing a lot of data to figure out the ability to pay, uh, to figure out if, uh, you know, this person, what what is the kind of uh, you know, credit profile this person has. And banking data is one of the strongest uh, data sources to establish, you know, the ability to pay, for example. So, you know, what are the balances, etc., what are credit incoming, outgoing for a person. Now, imagine, uh, you know, in, in, in the past, all of this used to happen through, say, PDF uploads or scraping, etc. only. Now, when you, one uploads a PDF, uh, the lender, when he's getting the PDF in a workflow, can, can never be sure if it's tampered or not, right? Uh, and, and it leads to a lot of frauds. And now what, when a lender is sort of scared that a lot of the data coming in might be tampered with, what they will do is they will put additional checks. They will put manual workflows into lending, etc. Now, see, imagine that adding manual workflow not only, you know, makes it a bad customer experience for the good guys. It also increases the cost, you know, very uh, by multifolds. Now, what that does is that, you know, overall, say, it makes the processing of the application very, very uh, expensive. And as the processing of the application becomes expensive, to justify this cost, the ticket size of the loans become larger. And as ticket size of the loan becomes larger, the guys who are eligible for smaller loans get left behind. And this is classically what is financial exclusion, right? So you can imagine anything that adds efficiency to the system, reduces frauds, removes, you know, bottlenecks in sharing data, makes it more secure, makes it cleaner, overall easier to process. It's trust in the system overall, not only simplifies the way we build lending applications, it also enables innovation at the front end. It enables ticket sales to go down and so that everybody, you know, the guys who are sort of right now that are not in the net of credit, uh, today can be served with tailored credit products. So it does a lot of things. The second order effects of the account aggregator framework are immense. And it I wouldn't say it has even played out or, you know, people haven't yet imagined how uh, effective it could be as the overall coverage of the framework improves. And on the technology side, it will lead to entirely reimagined systems of how this gets consumed, uh, you know, what data processing, uh, you know, can be done on it and what are the kind of experiences that we are imagining for the end consumer, right? All of these things will will become very, very, uh, you know, they're sort of not going to be incremental changes. They are step changes in experience, in fraud prevention, in tailored credit products, in uh, improvement of financial inclusion overall. Uh, so it's 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 something that is a master stroke. Of course, it the the entire ecosystem with Samati with all of the uh, FIPs um, and you know the entire technology architects have worked very very hard and it's taken you know lots of deep uh, you know deep work and deep deep conviction for the entire ecosystem to make this work. And uh, we are at a point where we can celebrate this. Uh, it's no longer a toy. It is something that has become a serious innovation for the entire country. Thank you, Raja. So just for the benefit of our viewers, quickly uh, summarizing, there are three main categories involved in the AA ecosystem. One, as they refer to FIPs, are financial information providers. Uh, then there are account aggregators. Uh, who are nothing but consent managers, and then there are financial information users. So a customer can essentially share their data that they get from the that's lying with the financial information providers, and they can share it with anybody through a very secure framework. Now moving on, uh, I'd like to come to you, sir. What exactly is Samathy's role in promoting a adoption, and how do you envision? the AA ecosystem shaping up? 
So, uh, firstly, thank you for uh, you know inviting Sarmati. Uh, you know because it's very important for us to speak about uh, you know the you know your current status of AA and mainly how it started and how we actually reached here. So, you know, one small correction is that you know we should we always say that you have you know four your participants in the AA ecosystem. The first one is the customer. Okay, then FIP, then AA, then FI. Okay, I know, it's, you know sometimes we actually take it, you know, for actually granted, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the customer is the most important participant. Now, Sahamati, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, want to understand, you know, what kind of a company it is, you know, it is actually uh, called a Section 8 company. It is a not-for-profit company. So, it was formed in 2019 with the sole purpose because we had got a request from the entities, okay, including HDFC Bank, which is here, that there was a need to have a body and, and uh, an industry, uh, you know, like actually body where all are participating in it, which is account aggregators, FIPs, FIUs, and, and people like me, we yeah, represent actually the customer. Okay, to ensure that each participant, what they are doing, is is in the interest of the of the end customer. Now, to to actually give some background, like I, as you told, the account aggregator framework was uh, like uh, actually published in year two thousand sixteen by uh, by RBI. But all the four regulators are actually part of it. All the four financial regulators. So, uh, okay, right, but which adds to the complexity okay because you know now you need to uh, it's not only uh, we working with the banks but the banks also want to work with the insurance companies the insurance companies as fiu want to work with the banks okay it is across the sector so that was one reason uh, it, this uh, entity was formed samati was formed the first year and a half we spent only in in actually educating the ecosystem about what AA is and why they need to participate in the AA ecosystem. Be, okay, because that entire fear of any entity, especially the large banks, having that they are your data givers and and not your data consumers, you know, I, I had to be clear. Okay, it was extremely important to say that everybody will be benefiting over here, and uh, and uh, okay because of the end consumer will now be able to suddenly access these large banks, you know, for the loans. It is very important for the large entities also to participate. So to summarize, you know, the first year and a half we spent in educating the ecosystem. Samati came up with what we call the guidelines, okay, on how, you know, how, how, you know, what the consent, the templates, what we have, it is shown to the customer, you know, what are the fields, which has to be shown actually to the customer, okay, to quickly tell you, like in the consent template, you have something what we call the purpose code, which says for what purpose is the FIU asking for the data and what is the data life? For what period are they allowed to process the data? So all these kinds of things, whether it is a one-time consent, a recurring consent. So we had to work with all. And of course, everybody was extremely cooperative. You know, I want to tell you, no, FIU was saying that we won't be transparent or something. But somebody had to do that job, okay, of having the guideline and decimating all that information to the entire ecosystem. Already we have now about 120 FIUs, you know, which are live. So if, you know, for example, each of the FIP has to talk to all the FIUs, it's going to be very difficult. Okay. I mean, then there'll be so many parts of, of communication. So the entities, including like HDFC, either as an FIP or as an FIU, if they have a problem, they speak to somebody and, and we talk to the entire ecosystem. So we come up with guidelines, you know, we come up with certification frameworks, which afterwards we can talk about, okay, you know, you know, all these kind of services, 
you know, we offer to the ecosystem, not on our own, but by involving the entities, involving the participants to see if uh, what we are about to re release or publish, you know, is it uh, something uh, they are okay with? And only then we yeah, publish the guidelines. Thank you, Mahesh. Yes, Radhat, you wanted to check in? And Mahesh, uh... Super curious at this point, you know, what your personal journey was like to sort of come to Samati. Why did you choose to, you know, uh, to come to sort of a non-profit and lead this yeah. uh, and what excited you, uh, you know, about this framework? So, it's a very funny thing. See, I have absolutely no exposure to fintech. I don't know. Uh, I, I would say, I don't know. I can't say that now. But when I started in 2019, I was like any of you, I mean, not like you guys, the wrong example, any of the ordinary users who was the end user, you know, of, of the products. And uh, I know I was always finding an issue that there was a gap in the financial products. And, you know, even though I am an engineer, I'm a software engineer, okay, but I have been involved in, uh, you know, your digital e inclusion. Okay, because in India, all the content which was being okay published from the time the internet went live, it was largely or rather only in English language, and only eight percent, eight to now uh, also approximately eight to ten percent of them could understand English. Okay, so I wanted to focus on the majority, and I, I played an important role in introducing Indian languages in. Get digital India. And uh, as I speak, it occurs to me that for MSMEs, it's again only 8 to 10 percent of them who have access to formal credit. Okay, so we have to solve, uh, you know, for by which all the MSMEs uh, have uh, or individuals have access to, you know, uh, into the not formal yeah, credit alone, but formal financial services, whether it could be insurance financial planning or any of those. So after I, you know, sold my company or rather my, my previous company, uh, which was called oh, oneindia.com got acquired by Daily Hunt. So I actually took a break for like about eight weeks. And in, in, the, in the meantime, I actually got a few calls. The first call being from the founder of, uh, of Perfuse Govi. Okay, because he knew that I had worked, uh, you know, a lot for the, the end user who was excluded. So already account aggregators and few banks were all, already speaking, even to the uh, technology uh, think tank in the uh, Bangalore iSpirit. Okay, and uh, they also approached me, you know, we, we had a talk and the main reason uh, they felt that I could deliver because I was committed to the okay, you know, your tier two, tier three citizens who uh, required an access to this. Of course, when I started Samati, of course, I had my doubts. I was scared about large entities like HDFC over here. Will they speak to me? Will they work with me? Okay, because I am not from this world, but I should actually give uh, you know your credit and thank the entire ecosystem, large, small, anything, okay, they, uh, they were extremely welcoming. And from my very first meeting with any of the entities, okay, they made me very comfortable. And I would say the advantage I had was I was, I, I am an engineer, I have the product experience. And, and thirdly, I was extremely committed to the ones who were excluded. So I think it worked out. Super. Thank you, Mahesh. And most importantly, for reinstating how customer is at the center of it all, right? And in this whole AA framework has caused about a paradigm shift in the fact that customers own their data and banks are just custodians of their data, right? Um, now, I'd like to come to Debashir. Um, you know, Mahesh was expressing his speculations about banks like HDFCs coming on board. Uh, so for a bank such as yours, you know, who operate at the scale that you do, or for that matter, any bank, a uh, large bank, what value do you find in a framework like this? And um, onboarding to a framework like this, what were the challenges, if at all any? 
frankly as for the challenges are concerned um, i don't uh, recollect any major roadblock uh, uh, yes uh, there are lots of lots and lots of work that we need to do going ahead to make a the next upi of india uh, and i feel this is the best time see there was a time uh, you know uh, there were challenges of awareness when it comes to uh, digitization of products in rural semi urban areas of india now if you go deep inside india every small big every individual has a instagram account every every individual has a net connectivity it becomes so much easier irrespective you are a financial institution or you are anything else to penetrate because the connectivity is there and um, um, we can actually move ahead. and a actually brings the customer convenience over everything else um you are actually practically sharing your data on a click of a button not going to any branches physically signing any documentations as i said earlier um so i feel this is the best time to kind of push a deep inside and with regards to challenges i really don't can't recollect any major roadblock or any major challenges that that came up uh, uh with regards to samiti or with regards to any uh, account aggregator onboarding the journey has been smooth uh, the journey is uh, is is uh, going in the right direction yes there is a requirement of a framework when it comes to um the fius uh, and i'm sure uh, samiti uh, is working towards that direction we have offline and online chats with samiti uh whether it's rbih uh, innovation hub there is a framework which is required for the fi use in general how much data what data why etc is all, already there in the customer consent but uh, a framework uh, once it is there i'm sure uh, as i said earlier nobody can stop top a to become the next upi uh, for the nation um i'd like to go to Ma mahesh and because this leads us to the next question what kind of frameworks are shaping up so that you financial information users uh, are made to you know use exactly what the data for instance if uh, i consent to sharing my financial data how do i ensure that my data is being used for the very purpose that i require you to use it right correct so yeah. uh how what kind of frameworks are it shaping up and uh, yeah. as an alliance what what's hap what's something that you're doing to work to work, make this happen yeah and i so, believe also the data protection bill is is in the making so once that's also in place you might have get more teeth to make this possible right correct yes uh you know the point, yeah yes there was talk about the data protection but she covered it So thank you. Yeah, that's okay. She put it on me. I'll speak about it, and then you, maybe you can add for whatever I missed. So yeah. I, actually, the point what you bring up is a very very important point uh, about how will the data be used, and and uh, this is something we have been uh, we have been hearing you know from the very first. Uh, obviously, uh, you know all the banks. Uh, see, of all the financial services, we all agree the banks have the the largest penetration you know like if if you compare to banks insurance and all of that on obviously it's the bank because if you want to use any uh, other service to investment insurance your pension fund the first thing you need to have is a bank account so obviously the banks are uh, you know do ask how will uh, our data um, be used okay because usually when something goes wrong the okay customer average customer may not go after the fiu he or she may go after the fi okay because i i had a statement with you it has gone even though they are the ones who gave the consent okay but the easiest one with whom they have a relationship is the fi okay right so now the the good part of uh, the thing what i have felt always from the very first day the ones who can participate the today in this ecosystem are only the ones who are you are registered and 
your regulated entities of the four FSRs. See, even though it is a you know a controlled environment, still we need to uh, solve all these you know your challenges. What if we had uh, if your government had allowed even the you know the the FIUs which are not regulated, then how, how do you chase them? It, it will be extremely complicated. So we need to have those all those your frameworks even before we can actually think of expanding the FIUs. Now, these entities who are there as FIUs are all regulated. So each regulator are, is already having a data governance, obligations, compliance, all that is there. Then you also have an account aggregator, your participation terms. It is a, a common a treaty which you know most entities have signed where the FIPs agree about, uh, you know, you know their obligations. AAs also give it in writing. FIUs also give. Everything is in the same document. Now, what we will need is, which we are working on, it will take a little time, but we are working with experts, including the FIPs, is to actually come up with an, an audit framework, which an FIU can run and you demonstrate either publicly or to you know to Samati to AA and FIPs that the way you know we are using the all the data we get from the FIP is solely for the purpose we declared and it is being used only during the data life. Like if when I'm applying for a loan, the your data life is about 15 days. So after 15 days, the lender is not allowed to use the data. So all this, one an entity should be able to okay demonstrate. So for that, we will have to come up with a framework. But uh, until then, uh, I think we will have to go you know, by the goodwill and their self-declaration, which they have given to the ecosystem that as an FIU, I will use this, uh, you know, this data only for the declared purpose. Yeah. So, Thank you, Mayesh. Yeah, Devashish. Devashish, you... you were saying something. No, no, I wasn't yeah. saying. Rajat, so, one quick question here, uh, uh, Mahesh. One is, you know, specifically uh, around this personal finance management use case, which is essentially, which looks like a non-regulated entity type use case, mostly. Uh, you know, how are you guys thinking about it and you know is that something that will eventually get promoted or uh, you know is it something that is in the works as part of the technical architecture but not so much uh, you know sort of something that is uh, being used or uh, you know should only be used as this uh, the ecosystem much was around it so you are speaking about the your pfm use case right it is a very, very important use case, okay, and it has already gone live, but you will agree that any use case, especially when it, it will come to a recurring consent, it has to be used in a very, very responsible way, okay, okay just because you have a facility, you, ca you can't have your hormones high and, you know, you know keep on. Uh, actually, like actually pulling the data. But see, FIPs understand, I mean, including HFC, that there is a use case, uh, you know, for the RIAs, the PFM, okay, they all are fully okay in supporting the use case, but it should be in a responsible way. So now what we are already started working on, First, we are working, you know, with all the all the wealth managers, okay, to understand what is the frequency at which you really need the update, the you know, of the data. So we want to understand from them, okay, that and okay, then we, we will be sh you know showing all those requirements actually to FIPs, okay, to see if you know these guardrails, which we we will introduce. Yeah, in the uh, you know you know you know for a example PFM use case, do they feel it is okay? Okay, and they may agree. Okay, they may not agree. Okay, and if they they don't agree, it is not like an FIP will tell I'm not agreeing. They will give some reasons. 
on why they feel it is okay not okay and then we bring everybody under one roof and actually come to an agreement so over here i want to say this is these are the kinds of the guidelines we bring by working with the ecosystem so you know we are one you cannot go to the regulator for everything saying that we we want the guardrail you know for lending we want for ri thing i mean i mean we do have enough and enough entities in this ecosystem already many more are yet to come who are yeah, mature enough to yeah, guide us on uh, you know you're yeah, developing the guidelines but your yeah, pfm will be an extremely important use case thank you mahesh i think he was mentioning about uh, recording consent from the point of view of personal finance management i think but it also spills over to lending because when it comes to credit monitoring uh rajat uh, i what i would like to ask, understand from you is uh, we at finbox we were one of the first ones to have gone live with aa and uh, what are some of the effects that you have seen and how have, have you seen digital lending transform especially when aa is integrated whether it is in terms of underwriting or whether it is in terms of credit monitoring um, or even frauds absolutely um, i think um, you know as i sort of mentioned again and again i don't think account aggregator is an incremental innovation in terms of how digital lending works it is definitely a step change which you know it forces its way into everything uh, digital lending and i'll give you a, a sense of this uh, in a way uh, so for example you could create a lending funnel uh, today with you know only account aggregator journeys right and you could say i will only work with you know borrowers who have account aggregator you know per se uh, and you will see that the economics of this loan is very very different from you know the economics of the loan that you were doing otherwise which was with uh, through other channels of getting the data one you can provide a completely end to end digital experience without any manual workflow Two, you can have larger or smaller ticket sizes at the same, you know, processing cost. Three, there are sort of overall the credit risk on. Uh, hello. Credit risk. Yes, board. we can hear you. So credit risk and fraud risk uh, go down meaningfully, even though uh, you know there are uh, removals of all these offline checks. and the the lending system essentially becomes much more data driven you can sort of instead of spending your energy um, you know really checking everything you can actually build an automated lending system which gets the data at a reasonably fast pace and you can generate really meaningful tailored credit offers that could be as small or as large or could be tailored to the exact need of the customer right so ultimately all these experiences theoretically were possible in the past but they were so clunky that you know nobody was able to complete any of these things and this meaningfully changes not only the customer experience it changes the architecture of your lending systems it changes uh, you know what you can offer as uh, you know overall credit etc so this is a meaningful a very very deep change that is occurring in the ecosystem yeah but i just want to add we will be missing out uh, uh, a big we will be, we'll miss out big time if we only limit a to a credit journey we see a huge possibility of a for liabilities also uh, we all know uh, every organization has way of defining a good customer and a bad consumer uh, or a not so good consumer a gives additional input for liability onboarding also um, so it's not only limited to you know onboarding or giving out a loan or a pfm if we put our brains together it's a great source for us to open a liability account right i'd like to follow that up with the question uh yes sir did you no so i was just adding that you know uh, reasonably good quality data that is available to a system for decision making with consent changes the very way you do business and as devashish was saying that you know 
you can not you know change the way you offer a certain credit a certain liability products or wealth products or you know any of the products that you are building and which also means that the kind of investments in your technology stack need will change earlier you were trying to sort of smoothen out you know clunky journeys uh, or sort of assist people uh, with feet on street or tablet driven flows etc now what you will do is essentially focus on building great data infrastructure that has a feedback loop to your you know user interfaces that also can create on the fly the right credit products or the right liability products or the right uh, you know wealth products for the customer because now you trust the input much more than you used to in the past and it can't be gamed earlier you know for example uh, people could just game it by sort of changing you know their own bank statements or you didn't really trust it so you never sort of invested in that piece of the layer of your technology infrastructure which was creating customizable uh, you know products financial services products for for these folks and that is a meaningful change in how we think about you know how financial services infrastructure is going to get created in the future and that is why i keep on sort of saying that this is not an incremental change it is not like just the original data stream has been replaced by a new world data stream it is an entirely new way of building these experiences thank you rajat uh, since we were also on the subject of the economics of lending rajat was just saying it about while ago devishish i'd like to understand from you um, as the a ecosystem matures how do you see this uh, impacting priority sector lending of you know mainstream banks like hdfc or any other uh, for that matter even gstn is now on board so um, what's the impact on msme lending and how do you see this uh, unveil see uh, aa is a important part for us for our, all our credit journeys um, we also now looking at to extend it to as i said to liability journeys as well aa gives us deep insights uh, which helps us to uh, make decisions on how much who where what all, all those things gst is a blessing in this guys and when aa also opens up uh, uh, other avenues uh, we will we'll have huge scope uh, to cater to our consumers see inclusion of gst has given us a i mean given way to this traditional approach that we used to have of lending based on balance sheet uh, you know uh, which was sometimes you have to kind of go read the data time consuming activities today a consumer can upload the asme in udyam portal you can fetch that from udyam aa gives you additional inputs verify both marry both the information and it's an instant way of giving a loan to a consumer um you know uh, uh, the earlier approach when we used to ask statements uh, the veracity of cannot be confirmed you know there was always uh, it was a cash flow as rajat earlier mentioned somebody can you know uh, make changes in the statement and it was very difficult for us um, as rds to kind of catch hold the changes that a individual is doing cash flow based data with gst and details will bring a great change to the msv msm in lending uh, process and this is the way ahead um, as as entities they are working towards it and i'm sure the ecosystem is also working towards uh, adoption of gst and via aa for all the msme lending purposes that's the way ahead and i i really don't see any uh, you know uh, it's it's a no brainer udyam having msme a having gstn marry both the information you get the health of the consumer and that's the way to go right thank you uh, speaking of you know, how we need more fi fip is joining Uh, Mahesh, I'd like to come to you. What is the challenge of onboarding uh, more and more FIPs, especially more variety of you know FIPs, whether it is you know brokerages or uh, even microfinance institutions, because they do a lot of legwork when it comes to uh, data collection at the ground level or cooperative banks. So the whole scope of what FIP as a category should entail. How do you widen it? How do you incentivize them? And how do you think do you think they'll find value in uh, joining a framework such as this? 
see, I think it is very important to yeah, convince them to join because it will help them as an FIU. Okay, then as an FIP, okay, because they will see the value on the FIU side to be so high. He'll say that, okay, you know, okay, so we, we will have to join as FIP because as an ecosystem, we have agreed if you want to be an FIU, you need to be an FIP because we had many, many instances where everybody said we'll join only as an FIU. And I said, fine, that the entire ecosystem can join only as an FIU and you can sit and wait for somebody to give data and we have only FIUs and then they understand, yes, we need to be FIPs. Now, see, we have to go stage by stage. Okay, like, you know, it is um, very easy to plan that in the, in the first 12 months, we'll have all the banks as FIPs and all that. You know, it won't work that way. And we were very fortunate because the ones who showed interest and who actually backed us were the yeah, large private banks uh, and State Bank of India. Okay, so when these... Uh, uh, these large banks have agreed to join and uh, agreed to experiment more than half the battle you have already won. Okay, because you have the leaders actually joining. Once the leaders join, everybody else will follow. Now that we do have the large banks up and running, and now every day the number of you know your consents actually being given is you know you're close to a lakh every day. So it, it has been growing. Now we can use this data to actually go to the cooperative banks, etc., who may not be as you, you would know that as you know, you're technologically savvy as an HDFC or, or um, as an access SBI, etc. But now we are able to demonstrate to them, okay, to say that look, these banks have not come just as an FIP, but they're also as an FIU, and how these FIP. This all, all the ones you you said the cooperative banks etc. The on why they should actually join and according to me, you know AA will actually become a mandatory in the eyes of the, the consumer. Now example the UPI also if I'm right, you know it is not a, a mandate for any bank you know you know to be on the UPI network. Okay, because of the consumers, everybody is on it. You will not go now and open an account with a bank, which is not on UPI. In about five years, I mean, I'm telling at most five years. Okay, I don't think it has to go until then. You will not stay with the bank, okay, or an entity, any entity which is not on the, you know, on the account aggregator framework. The okay challenges we still have, which is uh, you know slowly being solved uh, and understandable. Like you know when these FIPs first come on board, uh, you know, on board themselves onto AA, they first go live with only one account aggregator or your two account aggregators as an FIP, and we obviously you you know you push by saying that you have to work with all account aggregators. Uh, okay, because it says that once you come live as an FIP, you know, you have to yeah, respond to like any query which actually uh, comes from any account aggregator. It has to be that way because the whole idea about the account aggregator is framework is what? Your data democratization. The your decision making lies with the end customer, not with an FIP or FIU. You know, I as an end user will choose which account aggregator I want to use from which FIP. I may have five accounts, but I want to share of only two bank accounts, okay, with an FIU. Every, all the decision making about the choice of entities, you know, should be in the hands of the end consumer. In view of that, it is hard, but it has improved. Uh, I would say that you are seeing FIPs are working with almost all AAs. And on Samati, we do have a table which shows each FIP is working with uh, which account aggregator. So, uh, yes. Uh, since we are sort of on the topic of, you know, many account aggregators, etc. 
I think one question in the ecosystem, which is a hard question, is um, uh, you know what is the going uh, you know business model for the account aggregators? Given you know we are seeing a lot of pressures uh, on on the commercials uh, on this. And second, you know, how do you see the ecosystem evolve over time? Of course, as a country, we would want, uh, you know, multiple, uh, you know, account aggregators. Uh, but eventually, uh, you know, we've recently seen a bunch of folks uh, who had earlier gotten licenses, return it, etc. So in your view, what is the current understanding of where the ecosystem of account aggregators is going and where it could it stabilize? See, the, you know, your business model, especially when it comes to commercials, I would say that we have uh, received a lot of requests, you know, from the large FIUs, okay, saying that, you know, we should actually step in to standardize the, okay, pricing structure, not the price, okay, the structure, okay, that each AA, when they submit a their commercial proposal to an FIU, it should have all these categories. Okay, but we have stayed uh, away from it because the regulations also are very clear. It is the market which will actually decide. Account aggregators and FIUs will actually decide on what the pricing should should be, uh, etc. Uh, yeah, as of now, you, it may you may see it as. Yeah, challenging, but I would say even in a year, as more more FIPs actually come, like income tax, GST, and etc., the usage of AE will increase more and more. The okay volumes will be high. Account aggregators, you know, uh, you know, will see their uh, revenue grow. But of course, I also want to see the yeah pricing should increase and not okay decrease any further. Yeah. Okay, that is, I mean, I'm openly telling that I think it should increase. Because the FIUs will be able to afford to actually pay, uh, you know, for it because they actually gain a lot by yeah. using the A ecosystem. It is only the two account aggregators who actually gave up the licenses even before the ecosystem started. Okay, yeah. it is okay. Yeah, it is that, but you know, all these are like uh, it is like any typical business or license. You know, you know, if few people take license. They give up. You know, few people start yeah. operations. After a few years, they say, "I'm not making money." You know, I give up, or it is up for sale, or few are happy with what they make and they grow. So you would see, you know, all kinds of their, be, you know, your behavior, which is not, you know, specific or special to a ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for the benefit of the users, you know, I'll quickly sort of talk about why, you know, I asked. So you know, we're now sort of. Uh, uh, you know, comparing the AAPs to the UPIPs, right? And my sense is the AAPs actually could have far greater impact and the value it creates for the ecosystem is much larger than, you know, payments, I would say, uh, arguably. But one piece is that the UPI business is supported by the government of India, you know, putting money in to, you know, support the entire infrastructure. In the account aggregator space, the account aggregators are course private entities who are building their own businesses here and right now you know, like everything uh, like uh, you know uh, there is it seems to be a race to the bottom is what we've heard and of course you know privately people say that okay is this sustainable or not and now the questions are that how will we have enough money to build and invest into the system as it grows meaningfully so india is a large country 140 plus crores of people and technology and sophistication and the investment required to manage, you know, very, very high value, high value transacting systems becomes exponentially expensive as they grow, right? And Mahesh, you will have known, of course, you've built, uh, you know, uh, your own company, etc. how much it takes to really maintain high quality systems. Yes. So that's, that's a, you know, conversation in the ecosystem that is going on. It is typical. I mean, everybody initially would speak about, you know, all these things. Uh, but I think it will settle down. You will see that something's, you know, actually happening. And your yeah, regulators also will be keeping an eye on what is happening. Because any regulator will want to ensure that their entities are sustainable and it is there and they're not spoiling the ecosystem. 
okay because uh, it should not happen that it, it becomes very bad and nobody is able to actually sustain but i think it will be fine absolutely cool that's super comforting <laughs> as big users or you know sort of evangelizers i think all of us want the ecosystem to be yes, super yes. healthy right so what we have is the last 10 minutes of the discussion so we will head towards wrapping it up uh that is what i'd like to understand from you uh one thing is mahesh was saying about how more and more fips will find use in being an fiu and that's convincing enough for them to come on board uh what kind of role can technology service providers like ourselves Uh, or any technology service provider you know play in helping them come on board especially those that are not very tech savvy or digitally native uh, so what what role can we play i think uh, you know first the we ride on what uh, you know the infrastructure of uh, the country is and i think we have a brilliant set of infrastructure pieces uh, in the country and uh, you know i would say there are two things that we feel uh, are, you know our role is uh, uh, one is of course order one which is helping people you know consume the services as they are which is essentially how can we help them integrate how can we help them maintain compliance how can we maintain reliability etc uh, that's one order two is as i said reimagination of existing flows existing Uh, you know sort of uh, sort of reimagination of uh, how uh, say business gets conducted given account aggregator is here so you know some of the examples are uh, looking at you know existing flows could be better uh, on the front end second is maybe uh, you know looking at deeper investments in the data infrastructure right now i wouldn't say any of the fius have you know so robust the data infrastructure that is real time can keep ingesting more and more data create more value um, and then adding on more intelligence capabilities that can flow back into uh, the core applications so some of these things i think the tsps are well suited to do because you know we tend to sort of see multiple uh, fios uh, working and trying to solve certain problems and i think uh, and we can you know given our infrastructure is new we are sort of cloud native born in the cloud etc we can move faster on certain use cases and you know it is our duty frankly to communicate these to to the to the audience some of these things will stick and create immense amount of value some of this maybe will fail but that is okay i feel so i think overall order 1 is reliability making things work order 2 is innovation and reimagination you know these are our roles overall as psp you know it's it my view so drawing from what rajat was saying deepshij i'd like to ask you do you see financial institutions leveraging fintechs or any other such players to boost credit dispersal you know some sort of a prediction or what you feel about it yes of course uh... you know uh, the data that you get has to be massaged have to be uh, you know there has to be some <clears throat> work to be done on the data so uh, i i i it, it's 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 the it's the relevant uh, uh, point that every uh, re today works with some of the other tsps to kind of massage this data which will be which helps us to take decisions whether it's credit whether it's something else so you can't take away that right so i think collaboration is the way forward and uh, what i what i'd like to finally ask mahesh is um, do you see such frameworks shaping up in let's say even other sectors whether it's telecom or healthcare or you know uh, whatever concerns non financial data i uh, i think the work has already started i mean at least in health uh, as we know it the work has already started and i hope some day uh, the account aggregator framework is able to speak with another framework or you know to get the data because like if the a health a, the the health in data we are able to share you know with a, a health insurance company uh, you know it will come to use in you know or uh, you are uh, deciding the policy and from what we know yeah try is uh, actively uh, working on a framework uh, and yeah you know, possibly 
you know to use the account aggregator framework itself uh, by which the, the four your telcos you know they can be fips as well as fius because even they need some amount of data to offer you know some uh, of these services like increasing their uh, you know their yeah, monthly usage limit etc so even for uh, that they may need access to the bank statement you will see that in this calendar year i would say that uh, you know not only the financial data in all other the kinds of the data the the entire framework about the data sharing will uh, will be seen so we've almost come to the end of this discussion any final thoughts or remarks that anybody would like to share yeah i just want to add uh, what my sure. just just mentioned uh, on other industry data imagine irrespective whether you're a financial organization or you know you're from a government entity or anywhere if you have a 360 degree exposure of a consumer it helps uh, anybody a long way today we are limiting our discussion to credit uh, for part of limited to what banks can do with aa if you keep aside banks there is telecom there is mutual funds there is insurances uh, you know everybody will have information which is real which is uh, real time and i say real means the accurate information which is real time and the decisioning of the same can be taken instantly so the ai i actually don't want to limit a to a banking banking uh, ecosystem it is way 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 ahead of uh, uh, what we actually imagine today uh, yes we have to work towards awareness which is which is a key challenge today uh, of a for a consumer uh, and i'm sure every institution is working towards making uh, the consumer aware that AAs are there to help today there is uh, not for all but there is there are few consumers who uh, have some kind of mindset what will happen to this data irrespective whether i'm giving a consent for one year 18 months six months and for the type of consent that i'm giving in however for a novice cons cons consumer who is not a digitally savvy he still feels you know it is good to go to a branch sign documentation and then do it so awareness is 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 very very key for us to kind of make this the next uh, U upi as as somebody has said in one of the webinars that it is a future universal data interface it's, it's the udi instead of upi aa and to make this happen um, one of the key challenges is to make consumer aware this is very very safe secure second i feel aa in the near near future will have an identity of themselves um, yes there will be consolidation what what the every folks rajat and uh, mahesh were discussing but i feel in the next future they will build their own, like, own identities which would also boost customer awareness and help every individual whether it's banking banking industry whether it's, it's telecom industry mutual fund to ease out consumer journeys but the biggest drawback is the consumer journeys to onboard everybody wants to onboard one consumer uh, this will actually ease out that decision making for a consumer absolutely let's hope that uh, this whole narrative also focuses on empowering user data as much as we talk about protection of data uh, so we've come to the end of this discussion thank you gentlemen for such a thought provoking and insightful session uh, and good day folks stay tuned for more such industry deep dives thank you thank you so thank much you thank you for having us right this was wonderful thank you thanks my thanks devashi